Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Curiosity on Stage. This presentation is part of a series meant to discuss new and emerging technologies making a difference in Canada and also around the world. My name is Michelle Makarski. I am the Science Advisor at the Canada Science and Technology Museum, and I am going to be your host this evening. For those of you attending with visual impairment, I am a woman with shoulder length brown hair and brown eyes. And I'm joining you this evening from my home office in the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. Before we start, I also want to thank those who are supporting us tonight. I'd like to thank first and foremost, the Ingenium Foundation, who is generously co-hosting this Curiosity on Stage series, focused on the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. We are truly grateful for the foundation's support in amplifying Ingenium's mission and particularly inspired by their mission towards science for all. In addition to the Ingenium Foundation, I would also like to thank the National Research Council of Canada for their support in making this series more accessible through translations, captioning, and transcriptions. Curiosity on Stage is all about inspiring thought by bringing together experts to get, bringing together experts, I'm sorry, to share relevant, essential, and engaging topics that matter. This particular series is significant as it commemorates the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, a story which has its roots in Canada and has been profoundly transformative to lives all over the world. Tonight, in conjunction with the Ingenium Foundation, I am delighted to introduce the second of three webinars in the thematic series, Beyond Injections, 100 Years of Insulin and the Future of Diabetes. As one of the most common medical conditions affecting Canadians, an estimated 2 million or one in 16 people have been diagnosed with diabetes. A century ago, this diagnosis would have been a death sentence. However, with the discovery of insulin, millions of lives have been saved and improved. Even though insulin saves millions of lives, it is not without risk. Insulin is fairly unique among drugs in that it is self-administered and self-dosed. In other words, it isn't, a it isn't a doctor that calculates your dosage and in giving you your shot of insulin. It's either the patient or their caregiver. Now, a person with diabetes takes insulin to keep their blood sugars in a normal range. This means deciding how much insulin they need to dose themselves with based on a variety of factors including what time of day it is, which foods they've eaten, how much exercise they've had, if they're under stress, and also any other unexpected blood sugar variations that need to be brought into range with additional insulin. If they miss, uh, miss time their insulin or accidentally take too much, or if a whole range of other stuff happens, their blood sugar can actually drop dangerously low to the point of being deadly. Our guest speakers today invented a product that saves the lives of those that find themselves in this life-threatening situation. Therefore, today I'm delighted to welcome two innovators who will be discussing their personal commitment to supporting other startup companies who are driving technologies that can help prevent severe low blood sugar before it ever occurs. Robert Oranger and Claude Pichet are the co-founders of Leucemia, the Montreal-based company that developed an innovative, needle-free glucagon nasal power, which is used for treating severe low blood sugar. What makes this product so innovative is how easy it is to use, carry, and teach others. All things that are really important during an emergency situation. Leucemia's glucagon nasal powder assets were sold to Eli Lilly in 2015, and the resulting product is sold around the world today as Baxini, glucagon nasal powder. Now, if you were at our last presentation by Ron Schlein, you may remember that Eli Lilly was also the first company to commercially produce insulin in 1923. Robert Oranger is the chairman of Leucemia Solutions and also currently serves as chairman for AMG Medical a Montreal-based healthcare company that is getting ready to celebrate its 50th anniversary. He has over 35 years as an entrepreneur, investor, and board leader in healthcare, primarily in diabetes medical devices and services. Robert's focus on innovation in the diabetes space stems from his experience of raising his two sons who both live with type one diabetes. 
Dr. Claude Pichet is the CEO of Leucemia Solutions. He is also an active investor, board member, and advisor in numerous private biopharma and medical device companies with an emphasis on companies that seek to prevent episodes of low severe blood sugar for people with diabetes who take insulin. Prior to leading the creation and development of Vaccini, Claude worked at private, public, and startup biopharmaceutical companies where he had his hands in research, regulatory affairs, marketing, operations, and business development. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear from these two innovators. Please join me in welcoming Robert and Claude to Curiosity on stage. Okay, merci Michel. Thank you very much, Michel. I'll start this off with a few words in French. Je, je tiens à remercier Michel et toute son équipe euh, des efforts qui ont mis en place pour cette soirée ce soir. J'aimerais aussi remercier tous ceux et celles qui assistent à notre session ce soir. On apprécie beaucoup le temps que vous nous, vous nous donnez pour uh, venir écouter à, à, notre, à notre message ce soir. So on behalf of Robert and I, I'd like to thank Michelle and the entire team for organizing this evening's session. And I especially want to thank all of you who've tuned in on, a, on an evening, uh, I guess late afternoon for some of you in the West, to come and listen to this story. So as background to our discussion about entrepreneurs and technologies we've been working on with these past few years, we'd like to give you some insights into the journey that led us to this point. So to do so, I'll be, Robert and I will both be kind of putting you into a time machine where we're gonna be bouncing back and forth as much as 20 years or more to take you through the story that led to the formation of our company, Lucemia, and eventually to the development of our product, uh, Baximi. Personally, my background, I'm a veterinarian. I went to vet school in Western Canada. I practiced in Calgary for about six years, at which time I wanted a change. And I was interested in the pharmaceutical industry. So I was fortunate enough um, to be hired by Merck Frost, Merck, the big multinational pharmaceutical uh, company, in their veterinary pharmaceutical division. I spent almost 10 years with Merck, uh, in Calgary for a couple of years, head office in Montreal for a few years, and then global head office in New Jersey for four years, various roles, marketing, clinical research, regulatory affairs, product development. And I left the company after about 10 years to join a startup in Colorado. So I went from Western Canada to Montreal to New Jersey, back to the West, this time in Colorado, to a company that was working on long acting injectable drug delivery. So we were working to take drugs that had to be injected two or three times a day to make it, for example, a once a day injection. And one of our projects was an ultra long acting basal insulin for people with diabetes. We were targeting a once a week basal insulin. And that's when I stumbled into diabetes. I became enamored with the entire space, the medicine, the science, the business of diabetes, I found absolutely fascinating. And so for the last 20 years, for me, it's, a, it's an introduction through my profession that I got into diabetes. So that's been my space for the last 20 or so years. Now, before I move on to the story, I think I need to give a little bit of background about hypoglycemia and glucagon in particular. So for those of us who don't have diabetes, like me, we have this incredible organ called the pancreas. And many of you already know this, but the pancreas produces many hormones but two really key hormones in glucose control are insulin and glucagon. They're kind of like the yin and yang of glucose control. So when we, people who don't have diabetes, eat a meal, the pancreas will detect that our blood glucose levels are going up. The pancreas will produce insulin. That insulin goes from the pancreas directly to the liver and then to the other organs in the body. On the other hand, if we don't eat, or let's say we exercise strenuously, and our glucose levels start to drop, that same organ, the pancreas, will produce glucagon. And that glucagon will go directly to the liver and it'll stimulate the liver to release glucose that it's been stored into circulation and that way bring back our glucose levels. So between insulin and glucagon, we have this kind of gas pedal break that keeps our glucose levels in a pretty tight range for those of us who are fortunate enough to have a highly functional pancreas. Now for people who have to take insulin, if they're type one because they're not producing insulin or type two because they're no longer responding to their insulin, controlling the blood glucose levels is really a challenge. There are so many factors that affect 
your glucose levels, it's almost impossible to do this by ourselves. So people with, uh, with diabetes on insulin frequently experience hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. So it's often going too high, often going too low. Now with hypoglycemia, we have three categories. We call level one, level two, level three. Or you could just call it mild, moderate, severe. Mild and moderate hypoglycemia, people feel it coming on. They can self-correct by ingesting, for example, a glucose tablet or some orange juice or a cola or a candy bar to bring their blood sugars back up. That probably happens easily once a week, maybe twice a week. I don't want to sound like it's not a problem. It actually is. It's a big disruptor in the lives of people on insulin. With even a mild or moderate hypoglycemia can kind of mess up a day, but at least they can be self-treated. Then we have what we call severe hypoglycemia. Now, severe hypoglycemia, by definition, simply says it's a hypoglycemia that requires the assistance of a third party to treat it. So the person may be unconscious, maybe in convulsions, or maybe severely disoriented and not really in a position to eat. So you need somebody else to help you with treatment of that severe hypoglycemia. And the treatment for severe hypoglycemia is typically one of two things, either an intravenous injection of glucose, which is something that takes place at the hospital, or a drug called glucagon. Remember I told you about the glucagon that comes from the pancreas to the liver to release uh, uh, glucose. Well, it can be given until recently by injection. So when Robert and I started working on leukemia, we were looking to address an unmet medical need for an easy to use glucagon. This is the current or the formulation that was available at the time. You can see it's a pre-filled syringe with a pretty large needle and a vial of dry powder. So in order to use this drug, a person would have to take the cap off the needle, insert it into the vial of dry powder, inject the liquid, mix it up, draw it back out, get rid of the air bubbles, and then actually go give an injection with this pretty big long needle exposed. So what happens in real life is that people wouldn't use it. It's a scary, scary procedure. And so people weren't carrying it, weren't using it. And unfortunately, a really good drug wasn't being used and that's what we sought to address. Now, Robert will tell you more about this when he gives you his background as a parent of two boys with, with type one diabetes. Now, before I turn it over to Robert, I wanna give you a little bit of his background so he can continue straight on with the discussion at hand. So Robert is an American, has a business degree, sold computers in New York for IBM for about five years before moving to Montreal to marry Marla in 1987. He bought a small biosensing company in Montreal that he eventually merged with a company called AMG Medical, for which he is still the chairman of the company. AMG Medical was importing and distributing a variety of durable medical goods. One day, one of his business partners at AMG Medical, Big Al, brought forth a handful of lancets and said to Robert, people are starting to use these lancets to prick their fingers, to do home blood glucose monitoring. Like it's a new thing that's being developed right now. I think there might be a business here. Robert ran with the idea and shortly thereafter created a new company that was selling private label diabetes supplies to US pharmacy chain, excuse me, US pharmacy chains. So what started with lancets ultimately became needles, syringes, glucometers, testing strips, glucose tablets for treating mild and moderate hypoglycemia in people with diabetes who take to insulin. So Robert had in fact built a very nice business in diabetes when in 1997, his world was turned upside down. And I'll turn it over to Robert. Hello everybody, thank you Claude. Um, so I had already been in the diabetes business for seven years, uh, as Claude had said. And um, then in 1997, it was August, in a span of less than a month, our older son, Corey, who was age three at the time, and a younger son, Justin, who was nine months old, they were diagnosed um, with type one diabetes within a month of each other. And I'll tell you that, you know, for everyone who is diagnosed with diabetes and put on insulin, type one or type two, there's actually a second diagnosis that I refer to as the unspoken 
diagnosis. Nobody even refers to it as a diagnosis. It's, it's the risk of hypoglycemia. And of course, the risk of severe hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia. This risk hangs over everyone like a constant dark cloud. It's a near-term, immediate potential complication. It's not long-term. It can happen anywhere at any time. And, and I refer to it sometimes as a plague. You know, when, when people are diagnosed and put on insulin, you think about and you go to Google and you read about long-term complications. You read about things, the eyes, kidneys, and, and um, this is immediate. This, this, is, this is at any time near term, and I want to emphasize this. And it's not just the, 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 uh, the risk of, of um, the event. It's not just when it happens, but it's the fear and the anxiety of hypoglycemia that affects all kinds of interactions that you have. As parents, my wife and I were constantly thinking about who's got our kids' backs. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes to share some insights, including some of our inner thoughts um, about how we navigated life over those first 10 years from the time that our boys were diagnosed and put on insulin. Um, uh, importantly, I want you to keep in mind that during the first 10 years that our kids were diagnosed and put on insulin, <coughs> the only option for teaching rescue to others was the complicated needle-based glucagon kit that Claude held up. So if you would with me, envision that there were different groups of people who were very important to us and our boys. Um, I'll start with teachers, uh, first groups, teachers, school nurses, babysitters, parents of kids of our friends and hockey coaches. And in all of these cases, we had to project ahead based on the personality of the individual we were gonna have to speak with and teach how they might have to rescue um, one of our boys and how they might react to actually being taught about something so complicated. Um, we, 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 we thought about the timing of doing the teaching and its impact in every conversation. Um, and I'll use, um, um, I'll use a hockey coach as an example. Um, my wife, Marla, she taught so many school nurses, so many babysitters, so many teachers, and, and, and there was anxiety in each example, but the hockey coach we both had to consider, and that, that's a unique example because we have to actually think about the timing, you know, whether we would tell the coach about rescue and their responsibility and role, which they didn't sign up for, they were just the hockey coach, um, wh whether we would tell the coach before our kids made the team, or would we wait until after all the tryouts were over and then tell the coach? And so there, there were subtleties in, in sharing this responsibility with another of, of what they would need to do in rescue. <laughs> the grandparents, um, different situation. Our boys had loving grandparents, they still do. But right or wrong, my wife and I made a judgment call that it would be just too much of a burden for them to be trained on the glucagon kit. And, and we might have been wrong on that, but. As a result of our judgment and our decision there, um, the, the grandparents, our kids had limited chunks of time with their grandparents. We were typically always there at the same time, or if they were alone with our kids, it was a specific short period of time. It wasn't, um, there were no sleepovers. And, and the, the idea of training grandparents on how to use a glucagon kit for a sleepover and for uh, a severe low blood sugar that could happen at two in the morning. It was just some, not something we wanted to do. The, the kind of the one other example that, that is, uh, I want to paint a picture for you if I could, is the college roommate. You know, as, as our older son got older, he was heading towards his freshman year. He had a roommate that knew he had diabetes. And as we drove to school, we knew that the roommate knew he had diabetes, but we said to our son, do you want to share about rescue, about glucagon with your roommate, or do you want us to share it? Do you want us to tell him what he would need to do with the glucagon kit? And our son actually said, you know what, um, let me handle it. I'll handle it. And we, we got to the school and uh, we were moving him in and day one passed. And we asked our son whether he had had the conversation and he hadn't had it. And day two passed. And by day three, we were leaving and we were going to head back home. Uh, to Montreal. And, and we said to our son, have you spoken to your roommate yet to teach him about glucagon? And 
he said, no, I haven't done it yet. And we knew why he didn't do it yet. It, 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 there was a whole process to doing it and the timing. Anyway, he, he promised that he would do it and he did do it. And, and the roommate, um, you know, who had not signed up to become an EMS worker, um, he, he's a very mature kid and he handled it well. And fortunately, uh, uh, our son never had a severe low that year or during college and, um, and uh, it would never had to be used. But that idea of telling people who surround you and educating people, I, it was really starting to hit home with me. And I'll say that these personal experiences with my family led me to deeply understand the relationship between the risk of severe hypoglycemia and, and situation avoidance, uh, dependence on others, loss of spontaneity, constant compromise, increased anxiety and fear, loss of confidence and, and, and vulnerability. I, I had thought I had empathy um, during the early years that I was marketing glucose treatment products, glucose tablets and gels and drinks to pharmacies across America. But before my boys were diagnosed and before living through what I lived through with my boys, I, I learned real empathy. And um, I'll say that after 10 years of brewing and stewing on the horrible complexity of glucagon rescue and having put in the requisite 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell wrote about in his book, Outliers, I was ready to do something so that my boys could feel in their hearts that people could have their backs and that those who surround them could feel in their hearts whether it's a hockey coach or a grandparent or a college roommate, that they could in fact have the backs of my two boys. And um, I gotta tell you, I had no experience in pharma. I had primarily sold over the counter products and medical devices, but I wanted to do this. But if, if we were gonna innovate glucagon for rescue purposes, I needed to find a CEO with pharma experience who could lead what I envisioned to be a new mission focused company with a singular goal. And uh, that leads back to Claude and I'll pass it back to Claude. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Robert. We'll go to the next slide, please. So um, Robert and I were introduced to each other through a consultant named Dr. Alexander Fleming. He goes by the name Zan Fleming, former FDA medical reviewer, uh, endocrinologist, and now for the last 20 plus years and one of the world's top consultants in development of diabetes products. I'd known Zan for a few years and uh, Robert had met him in his search for somebody and that's how we were introduced. So in 2009, Robert and I started working together. At the time, I was still in Colorado. I wrote a business plan. Well, we wrote a business plan to try to innovate Glucagon. And as we were doing this, uh, Zan Fleming, the guy who introduced us, said to us one day, well, have you ever considered the intranasal route? And we hadn't. We've been thinking about a better injection, a better way to inject. That's, that's where we were headed. Anyway, after Zan suggested the intranasal route, I did a literature search that night. And lo and behold, I found a paper published in 1983 by Dr. Pontaroli from the University of Milan on intranasal glucagon to treat severe hypoglycemia in people. Then I found papers by Dr. Slama in Paris and a group of researchers in, in, in uh, Denmark that, you know, together gave us quite a bit of data indicating that intranasal delivery of glucagon might be an interesting approach. Robert and I actually flew to Milan to meet with Dr. Pontaroli, to Paris to meet with Dr. Slama, to uh, Copenhagen to meet with the, some of the Danish researchers. And uh, we came back convinced that the intranasal route was, was the way to go. And so that became the basis of what we decided to do. In 2010, I moved back to Montreal and Robert and I formed Losemia Solutions the company that we were building expressly to innovate glucagon for treatment of severe hypoglycemia. We were able to recruit a very talented team of individuals in and around Montreal. Um, Losemia was always a virtual company. We never had an office. So for the Losemia team, working from home due to COVID is simply a continuation of what we've been doing for a long, long time. We worked with testing labs in the area. We partnered with CABS, uh, KABS in St. Sebastian to do our manufacturing. We ran most of our clinical studies right here in Quebec, although we also ran some in Ontario and in Manitoba and in several states in the US. One of the studies that we ran, which has 
quite a Canadian flavor is uh, what we call the nasal congestion study. As we are delivering the drug through the nose, an obvious question is, well, what happens if I have a bad cold or seasonal, allergy, seasonal allergies? Will the drug be absorbed? So we actually started a study late one winter in Montreal where we had ads in, in the metro and ads on the radio basically saying, if you've got a really bad head cold and you're really stuffed up, you feel like awful, we've got a study just for you. And we managed to attract about 36 people who came in with a really bad head cold. We dosed them while they were not feeling well, had them come back a couple of weeks later when they were fully recovered, dosed them again. And we were able to demonstrate that nasal congestion did not affect absorption of the drug. It was just one of the fun anecdotes for this one particular uh, pro program. Eventually, we were successful in completing phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical studies, which culminated in the sale of the product to Eli Lilly at the end of 2015. So I'll turn it back over to Robert. And you can advance the slide. You know, it's funny, like Claude summarized, you know, in less than five minutes, um, this amazing journey we were on. You can't imagine the twists and the turns. And he, he summarized it with a happily ever after ending that the asset was sold to Eli Lee, Lilly. But <clears throat> we had plenty of angst and sleepless nights along the way. Uh, he mentioned the business plan we worked on, which as you can imagine, included extensive market research and consideration of other innovations in the diabetes field. And I wanna share with you a couple of old slides with images that came out of this market research that we did and ultimately became part of our fundraising pitch, pitch deck uh, for telling our story to potential investors. And when I look back at these images today in retrospect, they remind me of the actual internal debate we were having with ourselves, um, with ourselves, literally with myself, uh, with each other, and, um, um, and uh, also with advisors, trusted advisors, in evaluating whether to even embark on our journey uh, to, to, let's say, muster up the courage, so to speak, of whether to do this. So this slide that you see, <clears throat> a long history of innovation in insulin, you know, um, since insulin was discovered, there have been billions and billions of dollars invested by companies innovating insulin, and also the devices used to deliver insulin. We've gone from animal-derived insulins to recombinant analog insulins in various, uh, you know, long-acting formulations, fast-acting formulations, and we even have, um, you know, a few years back, uh, inhaled insulin. And on the delivery side, which is what you really see in this slide, you see in the lower left, we, we, we've gone from glass syringes, which needed to be boiled, to be sterilized, and needles that needed to be sharpened to individually wrapped sterile disposable syringes featuring thinner and thinner needles over time, to insulin pens and continuous insulin pumps. The innovation has been impressive. And, and I want, for those who are watching this who might be in the diabetes space and say, well, you're not showing current um, technology, modern um, tech. And, and that's because this is an old slide. Uh, and and the, the, what's featured in this slide are, are, are products that are more than a decade old. So none of the modern tech is depicted. Um, the, if you would go to the next slide, I'll make a comment here now. So we had this history of innovation in insulin and insulin devices, delivery devices, but we had this long history of limited innovation in glucagon delivery. And boy, did we think about this. We, we had almost 50 years of, of nothing. When I say nothing, uh, we went from a cardboard box that you see on the left holding the components of the kit. Uh, Claude showed you the plastic kit, but um, before we had the plastic kit, um, to, to kind of add insult to injury, uh, when the plastic, like, like you're seeing the kit on the left, the box in the left two circles are actually my son's kit that I actually, it was an expired kit that I pulled from his hockey bag. And for years and years, the kit in Canada was not even innovated to be the plastic kit that had been launched in the US. We never got to the root of why that happened in Canada. But we went all these years without innovation. Uh, we went from a cardboard kit to a plastic kit, but that's not innovation. And so you might be wondering why this was, and we spent countless hours wondering the same. At the end of the day, we concluded that there were several factors that hindered or, uh, you know, one might say blocked innovation in glucagon. 
And I'll share with you, you, you know, to the total market for insulin was billions of dollars, whereas the market for rescue glucagon was less than $150 million at the time we were considering taking the risk. Uh, glucagon innovation just wasn't attractive to be a priority for large pharmaceutical companies. And in a way, I don't blame the large pharmaceutical companies for this. They were focusing on making better and better insulins for which my family is thankful. So, you know, this is actually, you know, where small companies usually emerge to find innovative solutions to unmet needs and niche markets that are too small for big pharmaceutical companies, but totally worthwhile for a more nimble company to pursue. But yet it wasn't done. And we wondered about that, said, are we missing something? But in the case of innovating glucagon, in, in talking to potential investors who were, you know, who we were talking to seeking funding for research and for our research and development, we quickly came to understand uh, that they were totally spooked by the idea of investing in a project that had, from their viewpoint, double risk. And what do I mean by that? If we were going to proceed, this was not just the development of a drug. It was not just figuring out how to make um, a powder that could go on the nose. It was the development of a medical device that would deliver the powder. <laughs> and, and so we had double risk, drug device combination risk. And, and, and really investors, they got spooked, small market, ignored by big pharma. And um, I got to tell you, all of that being said, we felt compelled to take the risk because we felt that if we could overcome the technical hurdles, the total addressable market, in fact, would be many times the size of the existing market. We felt that the market was so small because the, the existing kit was so complicated or so, I'll say bad. And, and if, if the kit was simple and better, more people would have it, teach it, and, um, and, and the market would expand. So um, for us, it was an important need for people using insulin, but equally important, I wanna point out, it was an important need for those who love or care for those who use insulin. And so it was incredibly compelling to pursue this and we mustered up the courage with our own capital to get this started. Cloud, I'll let you take it from there. All right, thanks for our next, uh, we'll do one more slide. So our, our goal at Leucemia was really quite simple. We were laser focused on simplicity. We wanted to take treatment of severe hypoglycemia from a situation that's complicated and anxiety inducing to comp a situation that's simple and where people are confident that they can do the job. So next slide. So that's where we developed Vaccini, the nasal glucagon. You can see here, it's a really simple device. It comes in a little plastic tube, well protected. You open up the plastic tube, you pull out the device. That device has got dry powder in it and it's a simply a matter of inserting the tip into the nostril and it's literally a puff in the nose. The drug is then absorbed from the nasal mucosa and works essentially as rapidly as an injection. So that's, that was the product that we were, we were able to develop. Now we did it, we developed to a certain stage. I'd like to, to, to throw some major kudos to Eli Lilly who took the asset from us in 2015. They did an amazing job of completing the development work, of scaling up the manufacture, of obtaining regulatory approvals literally worldwide, and finally launching the product in multiple, multiple excuse me, multiple markets, despite the challenges uh, associated with COVID-19. So we owe Lilly uh, a, a big kudo and a, and a round of applause for, for the work they have done and continue to do um, with, with our rescue device that we sold to them in 2015. So with that, Robert, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, this will get into what we really now, we've set it up to tell you about what we really wanted to talk to you about today. You know, after we uh, uh, sold our nasal glucagon asset to Lilly in 2015, we were asked constantly about what we were gonna do next. And the answer to us was actually really quite clear. Uh, after working so long for so many years, in my case, on, on treatments for mild or moderate, glucose tablets, glucose gels, glucose drinks, and then working on a nasal glucagon, after working on products to treat hypoglycemia, we decided that we didn't necessarily want to 
or need to start another company doing something else, but rather we decided to dedicate our efforts going forward to working with founders of other early stage companies focused on preventing hypoglycemia rather than treating it. We'd spend so much time on treating it and, and it'll take time to get to those products that prevent it. But some founders, and there are many out there, they need help. And, and we felt that each company, even if they were working on just a tiny element of what would be part of a bigger ecosystem, that we wanted to help them towards their goals of, of preventing hypoglycemia. And we'd like to use um, the remaining time with you tonight to highlight some of these companies and their founders that are working towards this mission of preventing hypoglycemia. Chloe, hey, you take next, over. Yeah, next slide. So the, um, the for next slide, next up, please. So here we've got, uh, we're supporting several companies that are working on what's called automated insulin delivery or closed loop or hybrid closed loop or artificial pancreas systems. These companies are using software to connect an insulin pump to a continuous glucose monitor and then using algorithms that calculate the trends in glucose levels and automatically control the amount of insulin being developed. This photo represents um, a device being developed by a company called Beta Bionics, a company that was founded by Dr. Ed Damiano, himself a diabetes dad. He has a son with type 1 diabetes. Beta Bionics is one of several companies that are developing automated insulin delivery systems. Next. Here's a photo of a system from a company called Bigfoot Biomedical. You're seeing a cell phone, a couple of special caps that go on insulin pens, a glucometer, and an automated uh, and a continuous glucose, center, glucose sensor. For the vast majority of people with type 2 diabetes who take insulin, they do not use an insulin pump and give themselves insulin by injection. For these people, it's really difficult to know how much insulin they need to take as Michelle referred to at the very beginning of this, of this session tonight. One company called Bigfoot Biomedical is introducing a new product that can, connects a special cap on the insulin pen to the continuous glucose monitor and using software provides on the spot guidance for insulin dosing. Now like Beta Bionics, the company I referred to in the prior picture, Bigfoot Biomedical was formed by three diabetes dads, Lane Desborough, a fellow Canadian here on this call, Brian Maslich, and Jeffrey Brewer, who was formerly the president of JDRF. Next image. I'll speak to this one because um, uh, this is a prototype of a new generation continuous glucose sensor. Can't really see the details of what makes it different. It's using microneedles that will allow uh, the sensor to be, I'll say, I'll use the term pressed on, but more easily applied and applied on other parts of the body uh, different than today's phenomenal continuous glucose sensors. We have spectacular continuous sensors today on the market, but there will always be a next generation. And BioLink uh, is a company that's working on um, the potential of a multi-analyte sensor that uses these micro needles on the lower surface. It's sitting on the finger there. It's not because it's gonna be applied to the finger. It's sitting there to show you the context of the size of the sensor. But um, if we can get to a sensor that provides um, uh, information to algorithms more than just glucose, but let's say glucose, maybe lactate, ketones, and perhaps even cortisol, that could even improve automated um, uh, uh, glucose um, or automated delivery of, glu uh, of insulin um, and, and, and um, also improve guided insulin delivery in the case of a company like Bigfoot. This company and, and the way this network works, I was introduced to, to, to the founders of this company by Jeffrey Brewer, the founder of BioLink, who said that, Robert, you, this is a, an amazing early technology, too early for Bigfoot. You should go down and see them in San Diego. And I did actually with my wife and my younger son, and we visited there together. Um, I'll go to the next image. Um, uh, and the um, uh, next image is an, an infusion set. People who wear insulin pumps have to have the insulin infused and um, we need better infusion sets. This uh, particular infusion set is from a company called Capillary Biomedical. And it is uh, working, the company's working towards an infusion set that could last in the body longer, seven days, and not kink. 
Kinky is a huge problem with infusion sets, and that would be yet another um, improvement for automated um, uh, insulin delivery and preventing hypoglycemia. Claude, you'll take it from there. Okay, next, uh, next uh, slide. So here I've got an image of an old insulin vial. You'll see the relevance of that in just a minute. But we're also working with several companies who are seeking to improve insulin. Since the, the insulin was discovered 100 years ago, we've, there's been a continuous effort to make insulin safer, more effective, easier to use. We've been working with, with a company called Diasome Pharmaceuticals. Like Leucemia and Bigfoot and Beta Bionics, Diasome was also formed by a diabetes dad, a man called Dr. Blair Jiho, and the company is now led by his son, Bob, who himself has type 1 diabetes. So the company is working on an additive to insulin to make more of the injected insulin actually get to the liver. This is an important thing that we think would make uh, ins their insulin uh, a better insulin. We're also working very closely with another startup called SurfBio. SurfBio is working on novel formulations to make an ultra rapid acting injected insulin and also a room temperature stable insulin. As is the case with the prior companies we've been discussing, SurfBio was formed by two diabetes parents, both of whom also have spouses with type one diabetes. Finally, in the insulin space, I'll make comment about another company called Axton Bio, a Boston-based company that is working to develop an ultra-long-acting insulin, as well as what is referred to as a glucose-responsive insulin. This is an insulin that stays in the ejection site until blood glucose levels rise to a certain level. So instead of circulating freely at all times, it's only there when blood glucose levels go high. So if they were to succeed in this, we might finally have a truly safe insulin that would significantly reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. Next slide. So one of the challenges associated with injection of insulin is the development of scar tissue at the injection site. Out of habit, people tend to frequently inject in the same area. For example, a right-handed person might take the syringe and frequently go into the left quadrant, left lower quadrant of the abdomen. That's fine. But if you do it too often or over a long period of time, you tend to develop kind of a scar tissue in the injected area. And that scar tissue adversely affects the way insulin is absorbed. You might get poor absorption, therefore your glucose levels don't come down, or you might happen to hit some a fresh meat area, an area of, with good circulation and end up going to hypoglycemia. Now, the only way to prevent that is to encourage people who inject insulin to practice what's called injection site rotation where an insulin injections are spread out across different areas of the body. Now we've been supporting a small Montreal company that's come up with a really low tech idea to encourage people to inject, uh, to rotate their injection sites. They put their pen needles, four different colors in a box. And you as an insulin user decide which color goes where. So let's say you say, okay, blue for me goes in the buttock and green for me, goes into the lower abdomen, yellow is another space, and purple is another space. So when it comes time for me to give an injection, I go into the box and randomly pull out a needle. Oh, it's the blue one. That goes in the buttock. Next time I give an injection, I pull out, oh, it's the green one. That's my lower left abdomen. So I don't have to remember where I gave the last injection. I just pull it out and go to the site associated with that color, and it's giving me an injection site rotation scheme to reduce the complications. Finally, the last, uh, the last image, please, is a company in Toronto called Zucara Therapeutics. They're working on a new medication that we hope will actually prevent hypoglycemia. Their medication hopes to restore the abilities, the body's ability to secrete glucagon in the presence of low blood sugars. Interestingly here, this company the new medication is the fruit of research of Dr. Michael Riddell, a professor at York University in Toronto, who is widely recognized as one of the world's leading experts in exercise and diabetes. He also happens to have type 1 diabetes himself. So we've given you a, smit, you know, a small sample of the kinds of things we're looking at and the kinds of entrepreneurs and companies we're supporting with our mission of making a difference for people with diabetes and as well as preventing hypoglycemia. So I'll turn it back to Robert. You're mute. 
I was, <laughs> I was actually gonna make some more comments and I'm gonna skip it because I wanna leave time for questions. Um, Claude and I have not presented in this way and told this story before about all the companies we're working with. So we had no uh, real clue on the timing of it. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Claude, maybe you'll take that one. Yeah, okay. Well, I just we just want to show this last slide because the, some of you may not be familiar with this, but this obviously is a Canadian $100 bill. And that insulin vial in $100 bill is the one we used in the prior slide uh, for insulin. So it's a, it's a bill that came out in 2011, recognizing the discovery of insulin in Canada some hundred years ago, although, like I said, the bill came out in 2011. Um, what we're not showing on this image is some of the other things that are associated with, with, with vaccinia. Those of you who are interested in hearing a little bit more about how vaccinia is being received in, by, by, by patients and their caregivers, you do go to Instagram and do hashtag, hashtag Baximi. You'll read all kinds of stories of rescue and so on. And uh, Robert and I sincerely hope that the companies we're working with and others eventually have their own hashtags like hashtag Bigfoot, hashtag Diasome, hashtag BioLink, et cetera. So with that, we'll stop there. We've taken probably more time than we should have, but we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and we'll turn it over back to Michelle. Well, thank you so much, Robert and Claude, for sharing uh, the story. I, I love stories of innovation. It, it, it fascinates me how you how these ideas are generated and where they come from. So um, I'm going to invite our audience to uh, find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to ask a question. We've got about 15 minutes still that we can we can work through some questions coming in. Uh, as those roll in, I'm going to start with a, a question of my own. Um, where did you get the name leucemia from? Claude, why don't you take that one? Okay, so, so leucemia is just a play on words that Robert came up with. It's a combination of low blood sugar and hypoglycemia, low semia. That's where it comes from. And then what about Baxemi, which- So Baxemi is, is another story. Um, I, I said Robert came up with leucemia. He also came up with Baxemi. I can't tell you how many hours I spent in cars, on airplanes, in hotel restaurants, hearing them come up with one name after another, after another. But the concept behind Baxemi is really rooted in the concept of having someone's back. I've got your back, you've got my back. I know I can help you in a serious situation. And so back B-A-C-K became B-A-Q because B-A-C-K would probably never be allowed from a regulatory perspective in the name of a, 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 of a drug. But the B-A-Q sounds the same as B-A-C-K and the Q refers to Quebec where most of the drug development efforts took place. And, and then back, see me, the rest of the word is an add-on to complete the word. But it's a name we came up with and we're thrilled that, that Lily decided to go with it. The code, the code name for the project, which we don't think would ever have gotten approved by the FDA, but we loved, was uh, Schnozagon. Uh, I have a big schnoz and <laughs> Schnozagon was gonna be the name, but we, we went with a more pharmaceutical sounding name. <laughs> I mean, I quite like Schnauzer, I'm not going to lie. Maybe, maybe people in, in, out in the market will, as long as people who love or care for insulin users learn about the product, they can call it whatever they want. <laughs> for us, it, it's about creating a wider net. And I make a comment, you know, the people on this call tonight, at, you've learned something. We hope you've learned something. And spreading the word and letting people know there is now a simpler rescue glucagon. It means again, that my kids can know that people could really have their back. And those who love or care for people like my kids, school teachers, hockey coaches, nurses, babysitters, other parents, they can feel confident now that they can do this. And, and that creates a wider and wider network. And the simplicity also enables a discussion. It just the mere fact that we're having this discussion, we could have never had and talked about a glucagon kit for in this kind of a forum because it was so scary before. So we do say that, that we think that simplicity has been a discussion enabler. And the more discussion we have about uh, rescue of people who use insulin, the better, the more prepared will people, people will be. So on the topic of rescue, how often does hypoglycemia occur? Like a severe, you said once a, or twice a week for kind of a mild or moderate, but what about a severe one? So there, there's no, the numbers on that vary considerably depending on where you get them. But, you know, we say on average people with type one have 
one to three episodes per year. People with type two on multiple daily injections, it's one or two per year. But that number isn't really very meaningful because you have some people have five or 10. They're not aware that they're high, that they have hypoglycemia. And so they get like, they don't, they don't feel it coming on anymore. So the, the number isn't what's as important as what is it, what the fear of hypoglycemia. People mm-hmm. on insulin are always afraid of the fear. You know, it's the fear of hypoglycemia, that, which is really the, the hard part. So the way we look at it is it should always be prepared. We frankly hope that the kit expires because you should celebrate that you didn't have to use it, but you had it in case you needed it. What is the shelf life of it? I, I believe in Canada, it's two years. I'm pretty sure we'd have to double check with Lily. Yes. Okay. Um, are there any other considerations that you have to take into account with vaccine? Like you talked about having a cold and that's good, but what about people who have like asthma or sinusitis or like sensitivity in the nose or, or anything like that? Well, we haven't explored every single situation. You know, we know that the drug is indicated for people on insulin four years of age and above and nasal congestion associated with the cold doesn't have an effect. It's not inhaled, Michelle, it's absorbed from the nasal mucosa. So asthma has no effect on this at all. Lung disease has no effect. Um, you know, would there possibly be conditions of the nose? I'd be surprised. I mean, the, 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 the nasal passages have rich vasculature and a large surface area for absorbing medication. So I, I don't think there's any specific things, but we recommend people to take a look at the labeling, consult with their doctor, make sure that they're, they're covered on any potential contraindications. I have a comment on that, Claude, and, and, and we're talking to our Canadian audience. So uh, we're pretty proud of the fact that um, in, in the freezing, freezing, freezing tundra uh, environment, uh, you know, uh, up, way up north in Edmonton, Calgary, wherever you want to talk, <laughs> that, that the powder won't freeze. And so, it, it, you know, if you're skiing, you're out on the lake, you're playing hockey, you're skating, whatever, we, we've tested it. Um, uh, I should say, I can't make those claims. Lily would have to answer the, the point at which it would freeze, but I haven't seen that point. Claude, comments? No, same, same. Yeah. yeah. It's I a suspect dry powder. for a powder, it would be, yeah, it would be good for really low temperatures. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, So I'm going to ask you kind of a two-part question. Um, So someone's asking about some of these timelines on the innovations that you were talking about. Um, And I'm going to steal a part of that question that interests me specifically. And that's about these these AI programs that you were describing that kind of predict when hypoglycemia might occur and take into account come as some of these other um, chemicals circulating in the body and activities that are going on and such. How good is that AI technology now? Like how good is it at predicting the highs and the lows and then modulating that? So I'll, I'll say this, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to even try to answer this because I know one of the world's experts, Lane Despero, is on this call. If we could have <laughs> Lane answer that question, that would be the best <laughs> he, for the entire He's audience. laughing in the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lane, you do us a big favor if you could just opine on that. Maybe Elaine, if you can uh, type it in the chat, perhaps. Elaine's sitting on his, in his undies by the pool. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's muted. He's no, he's muted. muted. We have to, no, we have to mute him, Michelle. You, hopefully we'll have enough time for him to give a brief answer because it would be great. Well, well uh, our tech maybe works on getting him unmuted. Let's okay. do a super quick question. What is the price of Vaxime? Oh, I, I think in Canada, it retails at $125 or $130 a dose, if I recall. And but it's covered by private health insurance across the country. And it's soon to be covered by our various provincial uh, uh, insurance ball, insurance programs, like the RAMQ in Quebec. Yeah, and there was a press release by Eli Lilly about their progress in that regard with regard to access. Yeah. And uh, you can just Google back, see me, Eli Lilly, uh, Canada. It was the last press release Eli Lilly Canada did. It was just two weeks ago. So we're excited about news that might come uh, in the first quarter of next year. Lane's trying to give the answer. Um, I think I, I can talk now. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, yes. Oh. Great. Uh, uh, so it's an excellent question and uh, something that many companies have been trying to uh, figure out for years. What I would say is that uh, predicting blood glucose in the future is extremely difficult. Uh, I think probably the best we can expect right now for the conceivable future is around 30 minutes ahead. 
And part of this is because people do this crazy thing about three times a day called eating and eating <laughs> is very hard to predict. Uh, so uh, when you eat, how much you eat, the content of the food you're eating, is it a high glycemic index, a low glycemic index? Does it have fat? Does it have protein? So um, all of those predictions uh, that you make through the course of the day kind of go out the window every time a meal arrives. Uh, so what a, uh, a slightly more nuanced answer is that overnight is uh, uh, much easier to predict blood glucose because the 42 things that are contributing to blood glucose variation aren't present, the uh, stress, the exercise, the hormones, the, uh, the meals. So it is more predictable at night, but that's not when you need it. That's not when you need the predictions. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, what I would say is it's a challenge. Uh, people are working on it, but uh, predicted more than about half an hour into the future is pretty hard. Lane, can you make a comment though, without predicting it, how good the algorithms are in the uh, closed loop systems today? Oh, sure. Um, so a uh, broad uh, answer to that question that I think is supported by uh, a lot of both clinical and real world evidence is that people are able to achieve about 10% higher time and range from their status quo when they go on an automated insulin delivery system. Uh, and so if they, and by time and range, uh, I mean the time from in American units, 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter or in Canadian units, uh, what about five to 10, uh, four and a half to 10 millimoles. So uh, wherever you're starting from, if you're at 40% time and range, you can probably get 50% uh, time and range. Uh, and the reason why this is so variable is because uh, people's behaviors are such an important determinant of uh, what's going on with their blood glucose. Are they exercising? Um, are they in a stressful job? Are they going through puberty? Uh, are they uh, eating a lot or are they on a low carb, high fat di diet? Uh, are they very engaged with their diabetes or are they very busy with other aspects of their life? So people are coming at um, time and range from a, a bunch of different uh, uh, places and perspectives. But in general, automated insulin delivery gets you about 10% higher than that. Michelle, you should give Lane's home phone number or his cell number if people want to talk about it. I'm just joking, Lane. <laughs> but we're out of time. So we, Michelle, I we, we ask you. We are, yes. Um, we've got a few really good questions still in the chat here. So I'm going to put you two on the spot right now and ask you if I can type up some of these questions and send yes. them to you to answer uh, as course. a written interview, course, which we can post afterwards. Awesome. That yeah, would be fantastic. Course. Yeah. yeah. So um, with that, uh, I want to say a huge thank you to our guest speakers this evening, Mr. Robert Oranger and Dr. Claude Pichet. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your passion. And I think on behalf of millions worldwide, thank you so much for the life-saving treatment that you've made available to diabetic families worldwide. To thank our you. audience, I'd also like to say thank you for joining us and for participating and for the questions that continue to roll in and the thank yous. So my last plug of the evening is if you did enjoy what you hear tonight, uh, you should tune in for our third and final talk in this series on Beyond Injections. And that is occurring towards the end of March. Uh, that's gonna be Lisa Hepner, who uh, is the director and producer of a documentary called The Human Trial, which you know we've talked about the history of diabetes and insulin. We've talked about innovations in, in, for insulin users. And she's going to be talking about the potential for a cure. So, you know, a world where we don't have to worry um, about putting insulin in our bodies that doesn't come from our bodies, which kind of is, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate end game here. So if you're interested in that, check out our website, uh, sign up for our info lines. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you there. So on behalf of myself, on behalf of Robert and Claude and the Science and Technology Museum and the Ingenium Foundation, I'd like to say a sincere thank you to everybody. And I hope you have a great night, a great week, a great holiday season, and that you all stay healthy and stay well. Bye now. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everybody. Thank Good night. You.